Good evening, everybody. My name is E.R. Anderson, and for our folks watching at home virtually, we're so glad you're here from all over the world to celebrate Lila Motley's brand new book, Night Crawling. We are delighted to have this hybrid event, so we got folks physically here in the house with us at Karis Books and More in Decatur, Georgia. We are joined by Deneen Milner, who's one of our all-time favorite Atlanta folks. Uh, esteemed publisher, writer of 50 million 1100 books. Um, she can tell you the actual number, uh, but it's a lot. And um, champion of young writers everywhere. And so that is why I asked her to be in conversation tonight in celebration of this book, because of course this book would be an achievement no matter what. It would be on Oprah's bestseller list no matter what. But the thing that has gotten so many people talking is that Layla wrote this book when she was very, very young. And it's just turned 20 years old. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. All right. this, this book has already just you know, made it to the top of so many charts, is, is the conversation um, in the literary world. And we are delighted. We are always so excited when young people, especially young women, have such incredible success. So um, welcome to you both. Welcome to everybody watching here at Karis and online with us. I want to let you know if you're watching at home, you can ask questions and I will localize them later. And of course, if you're here with us in the room, we will also make space for you to ask questions. But I'm going to go ahead and kick it over to Deneen. Thank you so much for Thank being here. Thank you. Always exciting to be here at Karis. My favorite bookstore in Decatur, Georgia. Um, and I'm so excited to be here with you. The first thing I wanted to say to you, and I said that to you when I walked in, is how proud I am of you. That I just, you are a star. And if you're doing this at age 17, 18, 20, 19, 20, I just cannot wait to see what all you have in store for us. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Welcome to Georgia. Welcome to Atlanta. <laughs> Welcome to Karis. So, who raised you? <laughs> who? Who, um, who were these wonderful people who raised you? <laughs> my parents raised me, and I raised me. Okay. And books raised me. Mm. Um, I think, like, I definitely, I could ask you a lot, like, what did your parents do to make you like this? And, um, and I can always say that I think that I was the one who, who pushed me forward. Um, and I think that like, we often have like an instinct to credit someone else, but I, I think it was mostly me. I love that you're saying that because it is especially a young person's instinct to um, give credit mm -hmm. where credit may not necessarily do or where or to deny your own self your credit mm -hmm. how did you push yourself um to become this level of writer um i mean i think that i just valued my own stories first and um and fiction in particular for me was like a very solitary act i i did it on my own time i didn't talk about it I didn't show people my work. Um, I did poetry more publicly, um, but I think that, especially for this book, it was it was valuing the story and the impact that it can have beyond me, um, and and recognizing that even when I feel insecure or unsure of myself, that doesn't mean that the story isn't important. Mm. Mm. Okay, that's good and grown. That's that's good and grown. <laughs> Tell me, so you started out as a poet, though. Yes and no. I mean, I was writing fiction at the same time as I was writing poetry. Just one was public and one wasn't. So, um, I mean, I was performing 14, 15, 16 uh, every weekend and, and kind of just writing poetry all the time. And I was known for poetry, um, but I was doing fiction at the time, too. Okay. And who were some of your influences? You said that, you know, books raised you. Yes. What were some of the books that were your favorites that you found yourself kind of? Um, one of my first favorite books was Saxophras, Cypress, and Indigo by Izaki Shange. And then I love her poetry too, and of course, for colored girls, um, Toni Morrison, of course. And my goal is to get through the last, I think I have two more books of hers left okay. until I've read them all. Um, and then Jasmine Ward, I love her novels so much, uh, Sadia Hartman. 
nonfiction with her so much. Um, I mean, I just like I'm always reading. I think that reading is just so important, um, and and reading across just like all different kinds of authors and types of books. Well, that's what I was going to say because you know, like, and and I have to remind myself that I'm talking to someone who is 20, and so your experience. Um, like folks would think that at your age, your experience with books or your your um, your engagement with books would be left to the devices of, say, the educational system. Mm -hmm. It's just like I read what was mm -hmm. fed to me in AP literature, and mm -hmm. then you know, like occasionally I will pick up a YA book, and that would be, you know, the right. so. What made you pick up books that aren't typically assigned in mm -hmm. school or? Um, readily available at your mm -hmm. fingertips that people are like saying, here, you should mm -hmm. do this. I mean, I think we had like one bookshelf in our apartment growing up and it had books that reflected me. And I think that that just like from a starting place was knowing that there are books um, and writers mm -hmm. who who can write outside of kind of the norm of, of what we often get taught as literary canon um, and what, what writing should be. And so I think that a lot of it for me was just like starting from a place where I could think that I could be a writer. Um, and, and then going forward, I mean, I think I just started seeking them out. Once you find one good book, you start like that feeling that you get. Um, I think I just started chasing it and trying to find any book. That, that I can pick up and feel that from. So um, I think that a lot of it was looking and I mean, I went to the library and I love bookstores and, um, and I saw it and I sought it out. And then, I mean, I read books in school too. Most of the time I would have already read the book okay. that was assigned in class and I wasn't in AP classes or anything. So a lot of the time, like I also just didn't like the books that were assigned in class, even if I had read them before. Um, but being able to recognize that maybe the, the books that were fed aren't necessarily always the books that we're going to like, mm -hmm. and being able to uh, to be okay with that and to not feel like in order to be a reader or a writer, you have to enjoy the canon. Right, right. Did you pick up, where did you learn how to write? That's, you know, like, mm -hmm. there's not a whole lot of writing going <laughs> on, and what school did you go to? Was that something that they encouraged? Was mm -hmm. that support and programs there that encouraged mm -hmm. you to write? Like. How did you learn just sort of like the, the actual act of writing, mm -hmm. telling a story? Right. I mean, my dad, he's a playwright, um, but he's kind of like doing it on his own time. Like I would, he would, he'd go and he'd do his day job and he'd get home late at night and I, I would see him and I'd hear his keyboard start clacking mm -hmm. at night. And so I, I always knew that like writing was something that people did because they loved it and not because it's, you know, an assignment in school and not because it's going to make you a lot of money. Um, and I think that that knowledge kind of helped propel me into this idea that I could be a writer mm -hmm. and that writing was like a thing that I could do. Um, and then, I mean, I started, I got my first poem, I wrote it like five or six, I think. And I have like a journal full of my five-year-old poems. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think there's some like component of just an intrinsic like need to write right. Uh, right. that I can't exactly explain. Right. And then from there, I just kept writing and then I started writing short stories. And then um, I went to an art school. So I, I auditioned in like fifth grade to get into this art school, which is like part of our public school system. It's like a charter in that. And um, and I, I went to the theater program for three years. Um, and then I decided that I would rather like author the words that I was speaking okay. of than um, just speak them. And so then I, I switched into the literary arts department for high school. So I spent three years in high school just writing three, three hours a day. And like we weren't ever doing novel writing or anything like that. But um, I think that that taught me discipline. And like you write every day whether you want to or not. Um, and I think that that was a big thing for me. Uh, and then I just kind of followed my own craft and learned as I went. And I think that's like, I I wrote two novels before this one. Okay. And um, and I will never show anyone those two novels. <laughs> um, but I think part of that is because they were practice novels for me. I didn't know how to write a novel. Um, and even when I wrote Nightcrawling, the first draft was plotless. Like there was no plot. It was, it was just, 
a lot of vibes and like people running around and I um and I remember like reading it over and going like there's something wrong with this and I don't really know what um and and I kind of taught myself how to plot and I had and one person read the book and, and give me notes like you need to plot. And um, and so I figured out through that process how to add plot in. Um, and I think a lot of it has just gone like that for me. It's just figuring out how to create a story that works not only for me as a writer and like following my natural style, but also so that the reader can take it in and, and really feel it. That this is in your bones. It's very clear that it's in your bones and your sinew that this is yeah. this is what you were meant to do. Mm -hmm. Tell me how you um, came to the story for Nightcrawling. I mean, I knew I wanted to tell a story of like teenage black girls, and I wanted to center teenage black girls in like the narrative place that I think we don't often get, which is like a nuanced. Um, character and one who like has the narrative control and and so PR kind of came through that and wanting to to like validate and and not judge teenage black girls in the way that I think the world often judges us so um so I knew that that was what I wanted to write and then I I started to like go back to this case that broke in the Bay Area in 2016 of this this young girl who was sexually abused by Bay Area police officers and it had been like a huge story in our local media and I remember at the time that I that, that it was going on I, I was watching and reading about it and like it, it really did consume the media but didn't go national um, and I was thinking like why why is there this strange focus on the police department and the police officers and absolutely nothing about the systemic harm to young girls and, and how this represents that. Um, and and so then years later, when I was thinking about writing my next book, um, I, I was like, I think that that would be a really powerful story to tell and to put in the hands of, of a survivor and to allow her story and the, the fullness of her world to come before, you know, what we often think of as a headline. Right, right. So, uh, mm. Kiara is a hell of a character. Thank you. I found myself going back and rereading passages mm -hmm. in the first reading, rereading re passages to really understand mm -hmm. where she was coming from, the trauma that she was going mm -hmm. through, and the harm that was being done to her. Mm -hmm. How did you tap into that? Mm -hmm. I mean, I kind of allowed myself to fully embody her and and um and just like not not exit out of her head for the entire time that i wrote this draft so i i wrote it in, i think two and a half months the first draft and i did it that quickly because i knew that i like needed to live it as her and i needed to tell it as her um because i think if i told it from an outsider's perspective that that kind of judgment that we so like intrinsically unknowingly place on on characters like Kiara um, would come through and I didn't want any of that. Um, I wanted it to be like what does she believe about herself and her world um, and so a lot of it was just entering that and not letting go even when it was really hard. Right, right. I found myself having to look at her to remember that she was a child, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like to remember that she's a 17 year old yeah. girl who is going through some things. Mm -hmm. Tell everyone, in case they're not clear about it, mm -hmm. what the book is about. Yeah, um, the book follows Kiara, who is 17 at the beginning, um, and she lives in Oakland, California, and she becomes involved with a network of police officers who sexually exploit her, and it kind of follows the investigation after that, but, um, but really it's about her and her world and black girlhood and vulnerability um, and what we owe to each other. And, um, and I think the rest of it is all sidelined by the end of the book. And really it's like the most important thing is looking at her and being able to acknowledge her for who she is. Mm -hmm. Amen. There was a, a reoccurring theme, it seems like with the, the, the men or the boys mm -hmm. in the book. Um, her brother Marcus, mm -hmm. Marcus's friend Cole, mm -hmm. his conspirator, rapper, mm -hmm. producer guy. 
even Uncle Ty, mm -hmm. um, there was just sort of this thread of them sort of being the biggest, insisting mm -hmm. on being the biggest in the room, mm -hmm. the only one that everybody had to have their eyes on, right. no one else's, um, uh, uh, what they were going through mm -hmm. mattered. They were very selfish. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about how that came. Yeah. Like, what, how did that help Kiara's story? Mm -hmm. Or was what were you trying to say? I mean, it was really important to me that we acknowledge like the gender dynamics, mm -hmm. um, even in like this one family. Uh, and I think coming from there, we see that Marcus and Kiara, their siblings, they grew up in in the same households. Your sibling's supposed to be the only person that understands what it's like to be a child in your family. And yet the ways in which they were raised and socialized to put this like gap between them, where Kiara has learned that she is supposed to care for everyone else around her. And Marcus believes that his survival is dependent on him centering himself. And, and also, you know, this thing that black boys are often taught that the only way to, to achieve anything is to achieve fame through, you know, athletic success or rap or, you know, any of these things that really, in essence, teach black boys that their value is in the things that they produce and the way that they're consumed um, and not in, in their personhood. And so I wanted to be able to, to have compassion for the men in this book because I think that in many ways they are also put in, in a corner, mm -hmm. but also to recognize that for them to feel like they're they're surviving and thriving, they are neglecting the, the harm that they're doing to the women in their lives. They consume the women in their yeah. lives. They're thinking about Shauna, and I don't want to give away mm -hmm. the story, but thinking about Shauna and uh, she's introduced to us moaning yeah and and like moaning and crying mm -hmm. and, and wailing in a way that should be noticeable but goes right. unnoticed by everybody but the other girl in the room mm -hmm. yara yeah and so it that was just the dynamics between those mm -hmm. two kudos to you for getting it <laughs> because you know some of us it takes us a, a while to kind mm -hmm. of grow out of the idea that yeah. it's not necessary for the man in the room mm -hmm. to be the biggest, you mm -hmm. know, to take up all the air, and that it's okay for you to say, "Hey, I need absolutely help." Right. Yeah. So I, I thought that it was brilliant that you were able to create that dynamic mm -hmm. in the story. Where did the the uh, the title come from, Nightcrawling? It was. I mean, I understand what it. Mm -hmm. you know, but. It was the first thing that came I mean, I, before I'd written a sentence of this book. Mm -hmm. I had the title and I wasn't sure it was going to yeah. stick. You know, you need a working title to name your word doc. Right. And right. yeah, I, I like, I, I don't know, it just felt right. Mm -hmm. And I, I kind of waited as I wrote and um, to see if, you know, something else came out of it. It didn't fit anymore, but it kind of started to fit even more. And I think what, what drew me so much to this was that, I mean, it's an active title. It's, um, it's a verb and it's also a word that like isn't validated by the dictionary. Um, and I think that kind of parallels the characters who maybe aren't validated by the world around them, but that doesn't make them less real. And, um, and I think that that, like the title really encompasses that. Um, and and then it's also, it, it has these dual meanings of like literally walking the street at night. And then also, you know, the underground things we do to survive on the street, um, dealing sex work, which are all parts of the book. Um, and, and it's, I mean, I think it's just like, the the movement of the book um, exists in this title. Talk to me about Kiara's insistence on taking care of her little neighbor mm -hmm. and and um, what it means to not have a mother but to mm -hmm. mother. Right. Yeah. I mean, I I knew that Trevor was like this this character who embodied childhood. Um, and so in many ways, Kiara thinks that she can like grasp a bit of, of childhood through, through him. And at the same time, she thinks she can remother him. 
um, and and give him some of the things that she wasn't given. But she's still a kid; she doesn't have the resources to do that. Um, and he is just—he's another person to care for um, in a world where she cares for everyone and everything. And so I think that you know this love, this bond that they have—it's so central to the story and to like providing us with relief and understanding like how young Kiara is. Um, and at the same time, like she doesn't have the the ability to remember him. She's not his mother and she also hasn't received the mothering and the care that she needs. Um, and she's unable to give it to him. And I think the inevitability of, um, of this like collapse uh, Kind of drives the story forward where we love Trevor and we want so much for him and for them, but uh, we also know that it, it doesn't make sense in, in the context. Right. It won't last. It can't no, last. It can't. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about how you actually got the book deal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> how yeah. did you get this into you know the hands and you know? Who were the hands that had the mm -hmm. foresight to see the beauty in this book? It's such a process. I didn't know anything about publishing. I I think like I finished the book and I, I did one revision, I think, and I looked up how to publish a book. And <laughs> good. it was a very helpful guy. Um, <laughs> it was pretty clear that I needed an agent first. And I was like, okay, I'll let you an agent. Um, and you know Publishing is an interesting industry because there's so much gatekeeping and like just lack of information. Um, and I didn't have anyone walking me through it, and so I I did. I relied on Google mostly, yeah. and um, and I entered this this competition called Pitch Wars, which is generally for genre fiction. I knew that at the time, um, and I ended up getting paired with like a mentor who gave me notes on my book and I revised another time through that and then there's like an agent showcase through it and um, and that like expedites the agency process so I went through that and um, and then I, I started to get agent offers through that and I was in college at the time and I went to my advanced fiction writing professor mm -hmm. who Ruth is at she's a well-known author and she I was like I uh, I was talking to her about an assignment but then I I told her like I have agent offers and I have no idea how to choose and I don't know what I'm doing and she said well send me your manuscript and you know, we'll talk about it. And then I received a call from her agents the next day going like, Ruth has sent over your manuscript. Oh, wow. And um, and I think like, I mean, connections like that are, are how most right. people enter right. this industry. And I, you know, I was gonna be agented one way or the other, mm -hmm. but Ruth's agents actually drove down from New York to Massachusetts to come and see me the next day. And um, and they took me to dinner and they wooed me and I was like okay they seem great um, and so I went with them and we did a revision and then the pandemic happened and um, probably like, everything was just really unclear publishing wasn't sure where what was gonna happen you know it was kind of like, it was like early April twenty twenty mm -hmm. just we were all unsure um, and my revision was done and I had a meeting with my agents and they were like, you know, we don't know how this is going to go. We haven't sold a book yet. It doesn't really seem like anyone sold a book yet. Um, so we could take a leap of faith and try sending it out on submission or we could try to wait this out. But we have no idea how long it's going to last. And we ended up just taking a leap of faith and I think it went out on submission in the morning and by that evening we had editors who were calling and then I had my auction the next week. So I mean, week. I love it. Yeah, <laughs> I think like, it's a combination of a lot of hard work and luck and connections. And timing, like we're talking about, mm -hmm. um, so we're talking Absolutely. April 2020, April that's right around the time of George Floyd and mm -hmm. folks taken to the streets everywhere mm -hmm. and it's just like it made it felt like people opened their mm -hmm. eyes to to yeah that happened like right to talent. Mm -hmm. yeah to talent and stories that deserve to be told mm -hmm. and the people who deserve to tell them yeah and you know like and that that felt good mm -hmm. you know in that moment for a lot mm -hmm. of us to see yeah. finally something moving Absolutely. and shifting mm -hmm. in the publishing industry so yeah 
um, and yay to your professor for not blowing, yeah. you know, <laughs> hot air up your behind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, girl, I'll read it. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that she actually did it and follow through and and um, call me like all. every week after that because I, I think even after the the deal, like it was two years between right. that and. Right. The book coming out right. and so much happens and right. you kind of like get thrust into a world and an industry that you know nothing about right. and no idea how to navigate it and i think for me especially like i was you know not even 18 i signed my contract on my 18th birthday and i didn't know how to do anything and um and i think that there was a level of like in ease to take advantage of me because I, I didn't know what I was doing mm -hmm. and I was very young and I think black women in general get taken advantage of mm -hmm. um, and disrespected in this industry and so like all of that on top of um, itself was, was made it a lot harder um, after the deal too but I right. think that having people around you um, and I've slowly met people who are like okay this is how we do this right. part mm -hmm. right. but it's, it's well. such a strange industry to enter, um, especially when you don't know anything about it. Without question. Mm -hmm. Tell me, at, okay, so you're 20, you just turned 20, but you wrote this book when you were, what, 16, 17, mm -hmm. right? So I'm thinking about my 20 year old daughter mm -hmm. and <laughs> the kind of person that she was at 17, mm -hmm. which, you know, an awesome person, but mm -hmm. she's a completely different person yes. now at 20. Mm -hmm. Do you think this story would have been different had you written it today? I don't think I would have written it today. I think that, really? yeah, I, I mean, three years is a long time when, you know, your life is only 20 years, like three years, I don't know, I'm not very good at math, but it's like a significant <laughs> fraction of my life. And so like so much rapid change happens in that period. I am not the same person that I was when I wrote this book. And I mean, I was 17, I was ready from a 17 year old's perspective, and I don't think that I would have been able to do that justice now right. in the same way, um, especially because so much of this book is dependent on us feeling how young she is and mm -hmm. continually being reminded of that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that would have been a lot harder for me to do now. Um, and my writing style has changed right. and like so much has changed. Right. Um, so I don't think I would have written this book now. And I'm like really grateful that I did at 17 because I think it's a really important story. Um, and even when I'm like, oh God, this is a book that I wrote so many years ago. <laughs> and it's always like the, the paradox of being an author is like you, you have to go and represent this book even if you wrote it you know, right. lifetime. Right, 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 right. So, right. Um, so I think that a lot of it has been just like recognizing the purpose and the importance of the work, even if I don't feel like it is mine all the time. I think what, what was so beautiful and connective with it, though, is that it was written about a 17 year old by a 17 year old. Mm -hmm. And there are plenty of authors who are really, really, really gifted at honing mm -hmm. in on a younger person's yes, voice. Absolutely. I suck at it. I just, I, I, I'm mm -hmm. unable to can. I feel like we, we know what our strengths and our weaknesses are. And that is a weakness of mine. I can never, I, I've not been able to embody mm -hmm. um, the voice mm -hmm. of someone significantly younger than right. me. So I think that that was something that really grabbed my attention is that this really feels authentic because it was authentic, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> um, what, how did it end up being an adult book versus mm -hmm. a YA book? I mean, honestly, like those distinctions are, are more about kind of this like industry elitism than they are about actual books. Mm -hmm. um, but we know that like adult books get more respect on a literary level and um and so a lot of it just ended up being based on that and i i didn't really have any control over it but i think that what i ended up saying is like you know these characters are forced into adulthood whether they're kids or not and so you can put them in either category and and people will read it and see you know something that they they can understand yeah. in it so it didn't end up mattering what distinction it was but i do think it's interesting um, that it that it didn't get put in this way, and I think that's a lot of the times just because why is discredited, no matter how beautiful it can be. Um, 
and young people read adult fiction and adults read YA, YA. and sure. like it all ends up not really mattering right. in the end, but um, but I think that most of it is just about like the kind of genre red lighting that happens in the industry. Mm -hmm. Say that again, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> <'Cause> I, <laughs> um, <laughs> so, tell me how you found out about the big Oh, yes. uh, it was it was the most surprising day of my life. Um, it was like five months ago, five or six months ago. So it's it's like there's a long lead time. Um, and we knew that like book club picks were a thing that happened around that time, but um you know, you don't know how it works or anything like that. So I I was having a meeting with my, my team, with my editor, my publicist, and my marketing director. And that happens. We do Zoom meetings. Um, I didn't think anything of it. I get online. My marketing director isn't there. And I'm like, okay. Um, and instead, there's this there's this man. And he's there. And he's like, I'm your publicist's new assistant. I'm going to record it. And I was like, all right, sure. <laughs> um, I didn't know. Like, I didn't think anything of it. And then uh, there was a lack box that just said Penguin Random House across it and I figured you know it's probably like some glitch like Zoom things happen I had that happen before right. not with them but I was like yes you know it happens right. and um and then my publicist starts telling me that our pub day has been moved two weeks and she was unfortunately how days we know two weeks and they look really sad about it. <laughs> like they just look really sad like and so like I start panicking and I'm like, okay. Um, and I'm trying to just remain composed. And then the black box like turns on and Miss Winfrey is there. Oh and I think she's in a green shirt. Um, <laughs> and and I I she's holding my book and there's like no you can't mistake over Winfrey. Right. So right. I was right. like, okay. Um, and she she sings congratulations to me and then she like tells me that it's her book club pick and I mean I was just in complete shock. And I don't think like it took months to process it. Right. And then again when the news became public right. like, I am still right. confused to my whole <laughs> whole thing. <laughs> How does it feel? I mean this is your you're 20 years old. Mm -hmm. This is your first novel. Mm -hmm. It is a New York Times instant best bestseller. And Oprah yeah. says that, child, y'all better read this book. Read it, read it, read it. I mean, it's you know, every author's dream. Absolutely. Like, it is, it's unreal. Uh, and I, I think it's going to take me years to kind of get my head around the whole thing. I just, I don't know. I feel so grateful and I feel. Um, overwhelmed by the whole thing. I think that you know, Oprah's touch is, is unbelievable. And there is like no way to prepare yourself for it. Um, and I am kind of just like remembering to come back to the book and um, and to writing and just remember that like this means more more readers read it and and the book kind of has its impact. Um, and that's really all I wanted from the right. beginning. So. Right. And so what do you do after that though? Like when you, when you sit down to the page to write the next thing, yes. what's the next thing? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I, don't, I haven't talked about this yet, but um, I wrote two other novels in the past year. Uh, oh, these aren't and, the two that you wrote no, that nobody can read. These are two other ones okay. and scrapped them both. <laughs> and like people talk about sophomore novel syndrome and it's so real and we just like kind of the even idea of pressure and people reading it. Like when I wrote Night Crawling, I, I did not think anyone else was ever going to read it. Mm -hmm. And there is a certain amount of like solace that comes from that and so I didn't have to worry about censoring myself because no one was going to read it anyway and now like just the idea that people might read it is um, <laughs> is just like it creates an obstacle right. uh, but now I'm working on another book and I kind of was able to block that off and just write whatever I wanted to write and um, and then you know when I'm done with it I'll see if I want to move forward with it but um i think part of what i told myself was like you know if it's bad and if you don't like it you don't have to 
Do anything. No, one has to read it. Um, and this shelf is getting kind of big, girly. I know, but <laughs> I'm never gonna put out. Yeah, I don't know. I think that books like are so interesting because there, there's value in each of them. Like I, I won't pretend that some of them aren't good, but like doesn't mean that they're right for me right now. Right. And I think that I am allowing myself to like return to whatever feels right in the moment and write the book that like makes the most sense for me. As a writer right now, because uh, I've got time. I love it. You sure do. Mm -hmm. And and we are all luckier for it. Again, I am so very proud of you. Thank you. Keep going. Spread those wings and keep going. Yes. Who in here has a question for this amazing writer? <laughs> Specifically, you talk about this a little bit, but how do you how do you personally handle the how do you, I'm sorry, you talked about this a little bit, but just specifically, how do you handle the pressure of those high expectations? Mm, um, I remind myself that I'm a person uh, and that I have, you know, a life outside of what the public might see and, um, and that my writing, like I do it because I love it. Um, and if I don't love it, if it's not bringing me some kind of joy, then I'm just not going to do it. Um, and so when I go back to that, then I stop worrying about what other people might want to hear from me because I have to enjoy it. It's also a commitment to write a book. This is like three to five years. And, and that means that like, you have to love it and you have to, to like make a commitment to it, knowing that you're probably going to evolve from it before it's even out in the world. So I, I kind of try to try to make sure that like, I know what I'm getting into, and I'm doing it because I believe in the story. You're very wise beyond me, guys. I just wish you could continue to say yes. Thank you. <laughs> and so you talked earlier about how you um, were able to get into Kara's character. Mm -hmm. Character. What about the other characters? When I think about Marsha, Marcus, mm -hmm. and Trevor, I mean, you go so deep. Mm -hmm. I mean, I found myself laughing out loud, especially when you were doing shade to Marcus. Mm -hmm. I, say, I, I, I worked in a high school, so I heard some of those conversations. Mm -hmm. So just tell us about the process, especially like when I when I think about Marsha, I, mm -hmm. I saw her in so many TV movies mm -hmm. and just so different things. So yeah. Different things. Yeah, I mean, well, for this book, it's written in first person. It meant that everything had to come from Kiara first. And so the other characters, I had to view them first from Kiara. Um, and so a lot of what I did, I did a lot of journaling from Kiara's perspective. Um, I wrote a lot of scenes and then cut them. So I there was like so many scenes of backstory and, and extra scenes with all of these characters so that I could know them intimately and that like I could see how Kiara would interact with them and they didn't need to end up in, in the book because it helps me like draw the essence of these characters into whatever scenes they are actually in. And then I think with with these characters, I wanted to kind of turn tropes on their head. So we like we think of you know the black rapper, but we don't often think of like why mm -hmm. why is rap so important to so many young black boys? Like why? Mm -hmm. uh, and I wanted to to like be able to view every character with nuance. And Marsha, like she believes she is going to save Kiara. Mm -hmm. She believes she is like this That's idea of the white savior, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that she's mm -hmm. actually saving anybody. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I kind of like, try to think of every character in like this multi-dimensional way that sees them as more than one thing because I think that that's what makes stories true. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I have a, a couple questions actually. Um, Go for it. So the first is as a writer, I myself, I, I sometimes find myself um, writing like people I read rather than writing with my own distinct voice. Yeah. Um, I think that's something a lot of young writers mm -hmm. go through. How did you find in like find like a specific declarative like mm -hmm. voice to use in this novel? Because it's so like distinct. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I don't read anything that I might really connect to while I'm drafting. Mm. I just don't do it. If I think I might love a book. I won't read it. If it feels like a writer who I might feel like some kind of connection to, I won't read it while I'm drafting. And that means that like they cannot seep into my style because I've done it too. Absolutely. I think it's like, 
it's natural for us to kind of mimic people that we respect and um, and I think that as authors like it is so hard to find your voice and to keep it um, and and by blocking out the other voices and um, other characters who might kind of just start to move in on your characters um, it, it helps a lot and then I think a lot of it is just practice like you keep writing you keep writing you keep writing and eventually you feel like oh I'm very comfortable here oh I like want to push myself to hear this style like feels like me um and and then you just you go with that and you allow it to evolve because I think that our styles like our writing styles change too and that's okay yeah, very cool um and then my second question is this might be like you know top secret classified information <laughs> but uh, well, actually, I won't even ask that question. I'll ask instead. Are you open to possible adaptations of Night Crawling, or do you just want it to live and die as like a book? You know, um, I'm open to it. I think that for me, it's really important that Black women would be the creators around it, mm -hmm. and I am really okay with allowing like film and TV. Those are that's a separate art. You know, mm -hmm. it's a different art form and books are not supposed to exist in tv in the exact same way um and so if if i did that i would like allow it to exist as its own project um and as long as i trusted the creators on that i would be happy but i just wouldn't want it to be like a crime thriller or courtroom drama or anything like that right. because i think because you know exactly what would happen mm -hmm. just, right. because i think that that's like it's a it's really Marcia easy to believe Changing three weeks, um, and 
it like it gives it always gives me so much more perspective on my home when I leave and like I really haven't been very many places before tour so uh, getting to see like all of these places in quick succession has been just super informative. Um, I imagine that you got your passport for the first yeah, time. Yeah, I got my passport. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, I don't know, um, it's it's such a celebration. It's also insanely overwhelming. Um, and the internet is like a lot. Um, and I, like, the morning of pub day when I was at CBS, like, I gave my phone away and I said, like, I'm, I can't look at this. And I'm very glad I did that because like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of messages came through and they like haven't stopped. Wow. So now like I have kind of disconnected from the internet um, in a lot of ways so that I can like experience it in in person mm -hmm. and, and like feel it in the moment because it is like, I don't wanna miss it. And I think that when we get sucked into like social media, sometimes we miss the actual things happening um, so it's been it's been overwhelming and amazing and i i mean i'm just so grateful that i've gotten to go around the world yeah so since um you know rap is a part of this book did you have a soundtrack or a music <laughs> that you kind of played to get hype while you were writing i mean i listen to jazz almost exclusively when i'm writing um okay Please. yeah Oh, always jazz. Um, and I think part of that is because I grew up on jazz. It's familiar to me. It like, feels like the most, like, it's, it just feels like a, my writing, like my writing just flows when I'm listening to jazz. And then it's also like, it doesn't have lyrics. So I could not listen to rap while writing, but I like outside of the actual writing time, for sure. I tried to listen to as much music in general as possible while I was writing this, yeah. That makes sense. I like I there's I dog eared my copy. You know, the publisher sent me a um, a copy of the book, um, the pre published, and I just found myself going through and dog earing places where the, the language that you mm -hmm. employed is just otherworldly, mm -hmm. particularly coming from someone. Again, I, I know you're tired of hearing it. It's just like, well, I gotta always be young and 20. <laughs> but for someone coming from, I, you know, I, I hang out with 20 year olds. I know what 20 year olds, most 20 year olds are capable of, right? And that's not, no diss to 20 year olds, but I have a 20 year old, right? And she's not writing like this. <laughs> right, right? And, you know, there's, there's a, a line here that I just, I had to stop and I was like, dang y'all. Here we are, Mama asking me to wring myself dry of everything I got while she sits perfect, full. And I had to sit back and think about what it was that Kiara was feeling, what it was that her mother was relaying to her, and how in the hell a 20-year-old or at times 17-year-old, 18-year-old was able to not only feel those feelings, but to write it in this kind of way. And what made me kind of circle, what I circle back to is that you're a poet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now to hear that you were listening to jazz, mm -hmm. that's like some old folks stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I listen to them old folks. <laughs> a little Marvin Gaye, a little, you know. But I, some of my favorite authors of fiction are poets mm -hmm. and I don't like I can't write poetry to save my life like I just I gotta lay down and just take whatever is coming to me right but a poet um you think about Claudia Rankin you think about mm -hmm. Ocean Wong you mm -hmm. think about Mahogany Brown and mm -hmm. what they do with words mm -hmm. is just otherworldly and I count you among those mm -hmm. because yeah. of the way that you are putting these sentences together, putting these words together, stringing so many these words together. Um, would you count that as poetry? Is, yes. As how you? I don't know. Like I, my prose is infused with poetry because it is part of just 
how I naturally write, but I also like I try to keep them as separate as I can uh, because I write poetry too, and and I I like to have that be its own world and its own space because it feels different for me when I'm writing it, um, and I also think that there's just like often a different purpose for poems. Um, but like I I think that making language interesting and complex and turning it on its head is like part of why works of fiction are, are so beautiful, you know, that we can experience someone's head, especially just like as, as this intricate place. Right. Um, because I think that often it's hard to, to even kind of fathom what other people are thinking. And when we get to hear it in, in language that, that we've like never heard before, I think that that always like is, is my favorite type of work. So yeah, I mean, I think I love, I love poetry so much. And I love fiction, and I think that part of fiction is being able to build out these characters and let us love them. And then poetry is like really being able to translate feeling to audience. And when you can do both at the same time, I think it just like perfect. Mm, exactly. Absolutely. Hey, girl. Hi. <laughs> um, I have two questions kind of bundled into one. The cover is so striking. Yes. And I know you have different covers for different places, mm -hmm. like the French cover was so cool. Um, my two questions are, do you have a favorite cover or do you love them all? And how involved were you in selecting the mm -hmm. covers? I love them all. I do love them all. But like this one was the first one that I that I chose and I felt so strongly about it. Um, so I, I would say like I have a slight preference for this one. But I think that they're all like beautiful in a very specific way. Um, and, and I think that they make sense for their audiences too. Um, and, and they all feel like the book. And I think that that was really important to me that they, they all feel like the book no matter what. Um, I knew that I didn't, I, I do get like a slight amount of, I get input. I don't make the covers, um, but I do get to like say, oh, I like that, I don't like that. Um, can we do something more like that? Um, and this one with the US covers, I got like six options, I think, and I had, it was between this one and one other one. And I was really clear from the beginning that I didn't want a woman's face on the book because I knew that it would like it would give us an image of Kiara before we've met her and I think it would also probably look more like a woman than a girl mm -hmm. and that then we would already think of her as a woman mm -hmm. and we would already think of her as like someone much older than she is right. and so it was really important to me that we don't see her face yeah. um, and this was kind of like a good compromise between seeing her face and not um, and I also think like it has that kind of kinetic movement that the title does and that the book does. Um, so I love this one. And then the other the other countries, their covers have ended up kind of like playing on this. Um, so like the UK one is this bright pink and it doesn't have a face or a figure or anything like that on it, but it, it's like the same kind of bold color and feeling. Um, and then the French one has um this girl with her like with her braids down it's like a photograph um and they're like neon pink braids um and i love that like braids just ended up right. being a com component of this um and i, I just took my braids out but it, it was very fun for me to like be on tour and, right. and get to like mimic right right yeah. wow it is gorgeous isn't it it's just like i couldn't have, i couldn't have come up with this yeah yeah and, and shout out to your publisher for mm -hmm. um listening yes mm -hmm. absolutely yeah. mm -hmm. did they make any changes do you know like obviously besides the actual literal language translations were there yeah. any cultural things that had to be changed to like make french people understand <laughs> or did they just no. leave it straight up just like they really did come they, to the text yeah they left it pretty much we had some conversations about the title because this is not a word that exists in other languages. So um, I think the original translation for the French one was like in the light of the night. And I was like, no, that's, that's not it. it. <laughs> um, and, and we ended up, like, it ended up being like how to walk the night. Like oh, that was like, kind of like the, the translation of it. And that was better for me because at least it felt like 
it was in the same right, world. Right, right. Um, but I think it's hard with translations. Um, and I, I actually got told by a journalist who read it in French and in English that like it was a very good translation. Oh, so I, I can't read French, but uh, that and she was a black woman and she was like, they didn't do what they normally do, which is like mess up the language around like hair and skin and like all of that and it ended up being like very authentic representation but you never know with translations because mm -hmm. things change i mean it kind of becomes a different work of art too. and it's not like you can check it no <laughs> i have no idea what it says <laughs> <laughs> it's a live shot still yeah. mm -hmm. um, i mean you know it points to, to the many movies i mean so many people i just assume like you're a writer it's a one woman show that's it that's right. like Literally, there are dozens of people who help bring your work, your book into existence, which is just wild. So I think yeah. it's good for people to hear that. There are hundreds. Um, yeah, really. Yeah. Um, there's a question um, from Dee Dee. She asks, outside of writing, what are you currently loving that you have read? So I know you mentioned some other books, but is there anything that you're reading now that you're on tour and can free your mind? Oh God, I wish I could free my mind. I'm mostly sleeping. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not working, I'm sleeping. But, um, no, I just finished In the Dream House um, by Carmen Maria Machado. And um, I I read, I think when I, when I started tour, I was reading American Marriage. And then now I'm reading The Revisioners um, by Margaret Wilkerson and Sexton. Um, yeah, I've, I've kind of been bouncing around. Um, with with books, but I try to I try to read like one book a week at least. So mm -hmm. I'm on I'm on my third third week. I feel I feel like I did pretty good. I love <laughs> it. I love it. I love it. Those are all great choices. And we hosted um every, every well no we haven't hosted Carmen Maria Machado yet, but we have certainly hosted Tiari and Margaret Wilkerson. So two of our favorites. Any last questions for folks in the room? Yeah. This is just a burning question, and you don't have to answer it. But I heard you say that your advanced fiction professor is Ruth Ozeki, who's yes. an author that I love. I know. What can you, um, I guess, discuss kind of more of y'all's relationship yeah. and how that has helped you? Yeah, I mean, I um, I went to Smith College for like a year and a half. And when I was there, I, um, I, you have to like write a writing sample and then submit it to get into any of the like creative writing classes. And, um, and I really wanted to just go into advanced fiction writing. And I was told like, freshmen don't do that. <laughs> um, so, uh, but I was like, no, yeah, let's try. And she ended up letting me in. It's like this eight person, I think, seminar. Um, and, I I mean I, I went to her office. That was the first time I think I ever like spoke directly to Ruth was when when I went and was like, I don't know how to choose between agents. And then from then on she kinda like took me under her wing and um we we've talked like regularly throughout the past three years now. Um and she she blurbed my book yeah. for me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think like she was the first person first writer who like been through it who was able to tell me like this is what it's going to be like like get prepared get ready mm -hmm. um and you know i was told by other people who weren't writers like this is this is so great this is so exciting and she was able to tell me like this is going to be the most exhausting time of your life <laughs> and like you need to be ready for it because it's going to be exciting but you're going to miss it if you don't like slow down and recognize that you're tired now that you're going to really regret it if you don't pay attention while it is happening. Um, she's just amazing. I mean, I've read every single one of her books. She just won the Women's Prize. Uh, for oh, yeah. her speech. She did. Um, I had seen her earlier that day. That was my birthday. Um, and, and I saw her on my birthday because we both ended up being in London at the same time and um and then she she was, had told me like i'll be free all tomorrow you know i'm not gonna win so like i'll be i'll be available. <laughs> and i was like okay um, and then she won like she was so shocked oh, wow. yeah but she's she's just one of the most kind people i've ever met and like so grounded um and it, I mean, it comes through in her writing she she's just like such a cool author too she um she she's the most interesting writer 
I mean, there's like really nothing that I've ever read like it. Um, and she plays with POV so beautifully, I think too. Yeah, she she's great. Cool, I love her. Well, I want to thank everyone so much for your beautiful questions. Thank you to everyone watching at home, wherever you are in the world. Thank you to Deneen for all Ooh. of your thoughtfulness. Um, and thank you to you. Congratulations. What a beautiful, beautiful work of art you have given to the world. We're so excited for you. Yes. Um, I can't wait to celebrate your long career. So uh, I'm going to say goodnight to our friends watching at home.